Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the curriculum committee for Thursday, excuse me, for Thursday, February the 18th, 2021. In accordance with the mandated direction of the state superintendent, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's curriculum committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. The committee, Ms. Pastor? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. And Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cox. Ms. Cox, please now call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. I have Dr. McComas. Present. Dr. Wistad. Present. Ms. Shea. Present. Dr. Pirandozzi. Present. And we also have Ms. Kraft. Present. And Ms. Wicks. Present. Thank you, Ms. Cox, and welcome. Please call and note the names of all staff members participating in the meeting. Request if there are any other members participating on the call that you have not named. I don't see anyone else. Thank you, Ms. Cox. We will then move forward. Dr. McComas. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So welcome everyone to our February 2021 curriculum committee. Um, we have one main agenda item today uh, on disciplinary literacy, but before we do that, I just for as a courtesy want to let our committee members know in the upcoming contracts committee in March, you will see a contract that was all previously approved by curriculum committee. It's it's a one that always makes us giggle. Uh, it is plumbing supplies and you will see Ms. Shea's name is associated with it because while our facilities um, side of the house are the main users of that contract, it is also connected to um, our CTE programs, our plumbing uh, and contract construction programs. So just wanted to provide you the courtesy that you will see that coming up. We, it's nothing that uh, we brought today for approval because we already did a presentation, I think about a year ago, Ms. Uh, Shea or so, um, yes. but it's, to support air CTE plumbing and uh, construction trades program. So yeah, this nice. is a courtesy. Ms. Pastor will remember I learned the phrase close quarter tubing cutter um, and oh. learning of plumbing. 
<laughs> yes. I've learned many things in this job. I have learned a great deal about ventilation, circulation, and filtration this year with HVAC systems. So, right. um, okay. So on that, we will um, not delay any further, and we'll get into the the center of our presentation today is on disciplinary literacy. This is the next in our series of of really getting into the core work of helping to improve our student achievement. Um, and so I invite Ms. Shea and Ms. Wicks and Ms. Kraft, and they will take it away for us. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Good afternoon, um, Chair Pasteur and all members of the curriculum committee. We are very happy today to bring. I'm sorry. Good afternoon. Can you hear me now? Good afternoon, Chair Pasteur and members of the Curriculum Committee. Um, we are very pleased today to be here before you to share a presentation on disciplinary literacy. As Dr. McComas shared, this is a part of our efforts to um, use this opportunity at Curriculum Committee, not just for those items for approval, but also to really engage you in the dialogue of the system initiative work. And so our team is here to talk with you about disciplinary literacy and how it relates to our strategic plan, the COMPASS as well as um, remind us on or update us on the progress. Many of you will be familiar with presentations we've done in the past around our Striving Readers Comprehensive Literacy Grant. And so the, uh, we're here to provide an update on that work as it relates to disciplinary literacy and also talk more specifically about how disciplinary literacy is at the core foundation of much of our work in alignment to the strategic plan. So with that, I'm going to invite Ms. Kraft, our Director of English Language Arts, and Ms. Jody Wicks, our Secondary Coordinator of English Language Arts, to share about our disciplinary literacy projects. Ms. Kraft? Uh, yes, good afternoon. All right, so uh, can everyone see the screen? Yes. Yes. Excellent. All right, so we are going to be talking about reading apprenticeship this afternoon, and we're very excited to let you know a little more about our journey and how it's been going. Um, so by the end, uh, we're hoping to develop some understanding of how reading apprenticeship aligns with our system goals and priorities, the rationale behind selecting reading apprenticeship as a system wide framework to support literacy instruction. Uh, the instructional potential of reading apprenticeship and engaging students and teachers in practices of disciplinary literacy. Oh. Um, improving student achievement. And also we want to give you an update on what our district implementation plan has been for reading apprenticeship. So how this falls um, within our new strategic plan is under learning accountability and results and it directly uh, aligns with disciplinary literacy. And so under disciplinary literacy, it discusses providing all students with opportunities to interact with text in meaningful ways across disciplines. This key initiative requires embedding literacy activities into the curricula across content areas. And so as you hear uh, both Ms. Wicks and I discuss today, um, exactly how reading apprenticeship achieves this initiative of disciplinary literacy. Uh, it also aligns directly with our teaching and learning framework that we're incorporating authentic literacy experiences reflective of the, all the disciplines in every lesson that uh, we really want to move from the teachers being imparters of knowledge and really that students are creating their own knowledge and experience and doing the majority of the cognitive work in the task and the reading that we're assigning and that teachers are explicitly teaching content aligned to the rigor of the standards, including modeling through sharing their thought process. And that's where this idea of apprenticeship comes from, is that the teacher is apprenticing students in their specific disciplinary literacy and language. Reading apprenticeship proposes a different approach to reading in all content areas. As you watch this brief video clip, please consider how this approach to cross-disciplinary reading differs from or aligns with practices you've seen in place at BCPS schools. Video? I don't hear the volume, Ms. Crabb. Yeah. All right. 
So, Mr. Corns, when I went to share, it didn't give me an option for system video. Um, do you have a suggestion on how I might be able to do that differently? Sorry, I wasn't ignoring you. G uh, give me one second. OK, because it didn't give me any options. Miss Craft, if you share it with me, I can try to as well. See if that works. Uh, absolutely. Miss Shea, I already have it on my desktop. Give me one second. I'll fire it up. OK. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry about that. It's a great video, though. It's worth waiting for. I, you, I just clicked on to say that, that we just, <laughs> with bated breath here, we're waiting. We're exactly. Sorry. You should be waiting with bated breath. You're going right. to love it. <laughs> I know. And I'm more excited now than I was a minute ago. <laughs> we wanted to build the anticipation. And, and that we're was our there. Goal. I'm there. <laughs> So Ms. Pasteur, where did the term bated breath come from? When was it first used? I don't know, is that a trivia question? It I mean, is, but it's relevant to what we're talking about. Okay, please turn me on. It was used in Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. Oh yes, 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 yes. But uh, is that the first time it was ever used? That's what my Google says. <laughs> 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 okay. okay, I'm gonna have to go back and, and check that, Ms. Mack. Okay, yeah, see, you fooled me there. I would have known that if you said <laughs> Shakespeare. Daggone it, don't play me cheap. But I'm gonna take your word for it for today, Ms. Mack. Okay, well, so- as soon uh, as you said it, I was like, where did that come from? I have to find out. Yes, well. I remember that, but I, I'm, I'm going to go back now. All right, now we're on trivia. I'm sorry, uh, we're done. Let, uh, let me know if you can hear this. Okay. Yes, I just dislike books. Like it, I didn't get. Oh. My apologies. Give me one sec. Okay. I just dislike books. Like it, I didn't get entertained by them. I didn't want to do it because I really didn't enjoy reading. It was hard. Like I used to just wanted to, like to stay with picture books and like a bunch of words in it. In Mrs. Hambrick's science class, the lesson may be about force and motion, but the real science behind what students are learning begins with reading. These students are part of the reading apprenticeship a concept created by West Ed. They put together a series of strategies that are um, used with students to help them comprehend um, text that they're reading. Now in its second year at South High, these freshmen in the reading apprenticeship have been putting those strategies to use since the beginning of this school year. Kids are taught that it's okay to have those conversations about what they're reading and it's okay if you don't understand every single word. The success after just one year astounded educators with 87% of students demonstrating growth in their reading. Some of them improving as much as three grade levels. Scanner Dime would like read this and I'm like, okay, so I read it and it just like kept me entertained to it. And so I just kept reading. These lessons go beyond English language arts with social studies, science, and even math teachers guiding students to use the strategy. 
the lab that I'm going to do anyway. That's reading. How do you analyze it? The word problems that we do. You know, that's still reading because you have to approach those differently than you do like a fictional text or something like that. So it's still reading. It's just not what I typically thought of as reading. And the success at South High is transcending reading abilities. Teachers are seeing other positive changes in their students. What we're really doing in the classroom is building reading communities. So what we're seeing is that students are responding to text academically, but they're also creating reading communities that are beneficial once they leave the classroom. So they're talking about books more just for the enjoyment, or they're talking about problems they're seeing in books that you know can help them with the, the problems they see in their own lives. Now students are equipped to overcome challenges in the text and they're reading in transformative ways. In middle school, we had to do a lot of reading, and I used to just sit there. Now I'm engaged. It changed my life. Like, I feel more confident about reading. Thank you, Mr. Corns. That was worth the wait. That is powerful student testimony. Two years ago, when BCPS was applying for the Striving Readers Grant, principals and assistant principals were asked for their input in prioritizing school needs around literacy. The responses on the screen reflect the results of this survey. You can see from the chart that content literacy and literacy leadership rank among the top responses on the survey. Reading Apprenticeship is a program that fulfills this request. Next slide. In addition to responding to the needs voiced by leaders in our district, Reading Apprenticeship was also selected because of its research-based record. Reading Apprenticeship meets ESSA standards with a rating of strong, and if on the next slide we'll see an example, we can go to the next slide, uh, there we go. And on the next slide, here are some key, here's an example of some key findings on student literacy achievement outcomes. Student literacy achievement was measured through an online scenario-based assessment developed by Educational Testing Service for this study. The assessment was designed to measure the strategic reading processes that are primary targets of reading apprenticeship and closely aligned with the Common Core State Standards. The assessment was developed to be a more rigorous measure of complex reading comprehension than typical ELA state tests. By the end of the second year of implementation, RAISE had a positive and statistically significant impact on student literacy in science classes. The effect size of the impact was 0.32. This effect size translates into an improvement index of 12.6 percentage points. That is, we would expect to see control students to move from the 50th percentile to the 62nd.6 .6 percentile if they were exposed to rays. Next slide. Through the Maryland College and Career Readiness Standards, we see common threads describing what students should be doing in relation to literacy. In every content area, students should be challenged by the text they read, and they should be encouraged to normalize struggle as a means of developing new understanding of content topics. Across all subjects, students should engage in authentic tasks that require them to use evidence as they construct arguments, critique others, and solve real world problems. These dispositions and behaviors are central to every content area and contribute to building students as independent readers and thinkers. Next slide. Reading apprenticeship is based on a framework of four interacting dimensions to support learning, social, personal, cognitive, and knowledge building. For example, Teachers work with students to create classrooms where students feel safe to share reading processes, problems, and solutions. Students develop stronger reader identities. They learn how to monitor their own comprehension and how to restore it when it breaks down. And they use personal schema to build new knowledge. These four dimensions are woven into subject area teaching through metacognitive conversation, that is conversations about the thinking processes students and teachers engage in as they read. This all takes place within the context of extensive reading and increased in-class opportunities for students to practice content-specific reading in more skillful ways. The overall goal is to make thinking visible, to help make sense of complicated tasks and texts, to persist in these tasks and texts, and to build community around the reading and learning process. 
Next slide. All right, we've got another video. Let's take a look at reading apprenticeship in action. What changes have you noticed to instructional practices related to reading across content areas? We've seen a tremendous increase in reading um, across all content areas this year. We've seen um, teachers willing to, to use RA strategies in phys ed, in health, homeland security. We're not just seeing it in our, in our English, math, science, social studies classes. We're really seeing it across the board. I think one of the things that was very beneficial for us this year is that we made it one of our four main professional development focuses. So we started off the school year by um, introducing it to the whole staff. Um, we've probably had about six professional development sessions just specifically on RA strategies and kind of what it looks like in classes, what it could look like in math and English. And then we've modeled RA strategies um, in every one of our, uh, our PD sessions. So even if we're not specifically talking about reading apprenticeship, when we're having our own faculty uh, engage in a reading, we're, we're utilizing a golden line or talk to the text or use a metacognitive chart um, so that we can model um, how they can use it in their own class. And then we put the protocols and, and the procedures into our Schoology group. So when a teacher says, oh, I'm interested in trying that, um, those materials are ready for them and they can kind of revisit it. And we've seen teachers using it quite a bit. We've, we've done some surveys this year in terms of how they value and, and how often they're doing it. Um, and we were we were surprised by how many teachers said that, that they're using it at least uh, uh, once a week in their class and teachers are using it daily. So for us, the results have been that we're seeing kids more willing to engage in that productive struggle teachers willing to allow them to engage in that productive struggle. More stamina when kids are given a passage and, and or told that they have to read for information. Um, we've seen them utilizing those strategies. And how do students respond when asked to engage in complex disciplinary reading? We've also seen an increase in students' willingness to do that. I think the biggest issue for students sometimes is that they didn't feel the texts were always accessible to them. They didn't always possess the strategies or the tools that they needed um, to be able to take, to read a text that was unfamiliar or that had difficult or high level vocabulary. And I think that the reading apprenticeship strategies have, have made them more accessible and kids are more willing to do that. We've seen um, students take the initiative themselves to kind of use those strategies, even when a teacher doesn't ask them to. Uh, one of our focuses second semester, particularly in English and in math, is to move away from telling the students which strategy to use and letting them select a strategy that works best for them, you know, in preparation for MCAT. Um, we've seen students engage more in class discussions where it's more student led versus teacher facilitated. And obviously that's that's increased students being able to make deeper connections with what they're learning. So how have you adapted your approach to disciplinary text as a result of training and reading apprenticeship? In world history and government, it's allowed me to take complex texts, use emotional connections with that text for the students. It allows them to remember the content better and ultimately learn more from it because they're not just trying to find the answer. So what do you think are the benefits to your students? Definitely building um, reading confidence because now they're able to look at things that they would have looked at before that would have intimidated them and with purpose and vocabulary acquisition and things like that, they're able to really tackle it a lot better. So reading apprenticeship is a very good set of strategies to utilize with your students to be able to get them to understand complex texts. Now one of the problems we face as teachers is keeping our students engaged. 
Um, you can't really expect your students to come into your class and analyze and talk to the text of 20 different documents over the course of a 90 minute class period. It's going to be a hard time keeping those students engaged. So how I've adapted reading apprenticeship strategies in my world history classroom, as well as my AP psychology classroom, is bringing reading apprenticeship strategies to other types of stimuli. So for example, political cartoons, videos, pictures, anything like that can keep students engaged because it kind of breaks it up a little bit from just looking at documents or primary sources. So a couple examples. Um, I'm currently in the midst of my imperialism unit in world history, and there's a lot of political cartoons that talk about how, you know, Africa and Asia were divided up by European nations. And it really helps all of my students, you know, students with IEPs, ESOL students, to look at these political cartoons and bring reading apprenticeship strategies in. So for example, labeling what's in the cartoon, discussing how the cartoons make you feel, um, seeing if you can relate to any elements of the cartoons, talking about the emotion or the vibe that the cartoon is giving off. Uh, it really helps students understand those deeper underlying concepts. Another example uh, from a few months ago would be when I taught a slavery or middle passage lesson and I had my students individually listen to a very powerful poem about the journey of the middle passage and what slavery was like and they were able to interact with that in a way that you don't normally interact in a world history class talking about how it made you feel the emotions that it brought out the different elements of the poem and what the author meant by different messages in it and I found it to be very successful amongst all of my students so in science when students are reading texts it can seem very overwhelming and very difficult for them because there are a lot of vocabulary terms that they've never seen or they don't understand or can't pronounce so what you're seeing um, in this example is um, students were engaging and uh, talking to the text with a scenario um, from one of our culminating events um, which was on genetic testing um, so students were writing down any thoughts questions personal connections that they had with the scenario we then had discussions um, small group and then as a class about their logs so like things that they wrote in their logs um, which was really cool because some students were able to see that they made the same connection as a peer. Um, and then if there was like a question that we saw a lot of our students had, we were able to discuss as a, a whole group and kind of clear up that question. Yeah, it was very, uh, very helpful for the students um, to see that they weren't the only ones that had the same kind of questions. And it also helps our students who aren't as vocal that we can come around and see their questions and try to get them to participate. And uh, even if they don't want to, we can still have a quick one-on-one -on -one with them to get those particular um, misconceptions or something out of the way so they know what is going on and what they're going to have to do. Thank you. As evidenced by one of our own BCPS school leaders and school teams, you can see that with the right kinds of support, reading apprenticeship can produce positive results and impact both teaching and student learning. Here you can see a brief timeline of the reading apprenticeship rollout in BCPS. In school year 2018-19, we were awarded the Striving Readers Grant and began our reading apprenticeship journey. We offered introductory training and 70% of our middle schools and 60% of our high schools participated in the reading apprenticeship training that first year. In school year 2019-2020, we facilitated fall coaching sessions to support the continuous coaching model and we began an additional winter cohort for teacher training. This school year, we were able to offer two additional cohorts for te training teachers in schools who had not previously participated, and we were very excited to be able to refine our residency model to provide hands-on support of the implementation of reading apprenticeship across content areas. So we want to discuss a little bit about uh, how is reading apprenticeship um, aligned with culturally responsive instruction. So reading, apprentice, reading apprenticeship is based on cognitive apprenticeship, which derives directly from sociocultural theory. Sociocultural theory views human development as a social mediated process in which learning must be understood within a social, cultural and historical context. 
culturally responsive instruction helps create environments, curricula, and instructional methods that validate and reflect the diversity, languages, identities, and experiences of all students. Additionally, it sends the message that educators value all students and that multiculturalism is an asset. Research has found that drawing from students' cultural knowledge and norms contributes favorably to reading comprehension and thinking. We also know from neuroscience research that culture drives how brains process information. This is partly because everyone learns new information best when it is linked to what they already know. In other words, using text, materials, and examples that draw from students' cultural schemas and background knowledge makes learning easier because it leverages students' existing neural pathways. In the next two slides, we'll discuss how reading apprenticeship embeds principles of culturally responsive instruction. So first, positive perspective on parents and families. Reading apprenticeship creates the space for teachers to view linguistic, cultural, and family diversity as a strength providing an opportunity for strong communication and family involvement around the different types of literacies used in homes and careers, positioning each family as a value member of that school community. Secondly, reading apprenticeship has communication of high expectation. Culturally responsive teachers are socially and academically empowering by setting high expectations for students with a commitment to every student's success. Next, it provides learning within context of culture. Reading apprenticeship is built around the underlining principle that cognitive development must be understood within a social, cultural, and historical context. Next, student-centered instruction. Within the reading apprenticeship framework, learning is cooperative, collaborative, and community-oriented. Students are encouraged to direct their own learning and to work with other students on research projects and assignments that are both culturally and socially relevant to them. Uh, next slide. Culturally mediated instruction. The reading apprenticeship framework provides a structure for teacher that incorporates and integrates diverse ways of knowing, understanding, and representing information. Instruction and learning take place in an environment that encourages multicultural viewpoints and a law allows for inclusion of knowledge that is relevant to the students. Learning happens in culturally appropriate social situations. That is, relationships among students and those between teachers and students are congruent with students' cultures. Additionally, it helps teachers be able to reshape the curriculum. Culturally responsive teachers validate every student's culture bridging gaps between school and home through diversified instructional strategies and multicultural curricula. Culturally responsive teachers utilize students' existing strengths to drive instruction, assessment, and curriculum design. And finally, teacher as facilitator. Culturally responsive teachers are multidimensional because they engage cultural knowledge, experiences, contributions, and perspectives to foster open discussions and multiple perspectives to create a shared learning environment that is safe for all students. In the words of Lisa Delpit, students must be allowed the resource of the teacher's expert knowledge while being helped to acknowledge their own expertness as well. This conception of literacy apprenticeship suggests that the best teachers of specific discipline-based literacy practices are those who have mastered the practices themselves. These include the subject area teachers who have acquired scientific, historical, mathematical, or literacy discourses during their own educational careers. We argue, therefore, that for all students to attain high-level literacy, apprenticeships that demystify the literacy practices and discourses of the academic disciplines must be embedded in subject area instruction across the curriculum, rather than becoming the sole purview of the English department. For subject area teachers to embrace this work, they must reconceptualize subject area teaching as an apprenticeship into discipline-based practices of thinking, talking, reading, and writing. And so now we'll, uh, next slide, we'll take any questions. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Mack? Why do you think I have a question, Ms. Pestier? Oh, no, I'm only kidding. 
psychic, psychic moment. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think we count on our group dynamic. We have a whole system. Now. And we do, and we have a tried and true group dynamic. So yeah. I'm a teacher. And it's good. I, you learn your you learn your people. You learn your people. Go ahead, Miss Mack. Okay. So I understand that I as a person will naturally be drawn to things that I am interested in and, and things that I see myself and my life experiences. But I'm still concerned about the student who may be very engaged in the lessons in like middle school and high school, who doesn't have the functional literacy foundation to read well. So can you tell me how, I understand this approach and we actually use this approach at CCBC, like one um, semester, we use the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks across all disciplines. Um, so I do understand the benefit of, you know, embedding reading in everything. But if we have a 10th grader who cannot read well, help me understand how this helps that student. Can I start here or Dr. McComas, do you want to start? And then I'll invite my team in. So thank you, Ms. Mack. So, and um, invite me in as well. Oh, well, I'm happy to let okay. you go first, Ms. Petter. No, all of you go, okay. go through, because yeah. I'm going to give a real life, real life experience. So sure. go ahead. Sure, so Ms. Mack, um, my, my first answer is this doesn't. This doesn't do that. This is not a reading intervention program. This is an approach for disciplinary reading, writing, speaking, and thinking. And so we need to not view literacy development as an either or, but rather a both and. So for the students you're describing, they would be involved, enrolled in a tier three intervention, some of which we've already brought for things like System 44 or Read 180, Wilson, some of the others that are specifically about teaching those core foundational skills um, because they have an identified need in the areas of phonemic awareness or phonics. This approach is a universal approach for secondary students who are, because all of the students you described, we want them enrolled in specific um, intervention literacy courses to learn specifically those strategies. And we know that they are also enrolled in science and history and ELA and math. And so these strategies are really about those scaffolds, the specific strategies for processing, reading, writing, speaking, and listening across the disciplines in those other content classes. So it's not instead of, it's complementary to um, the specific intervention. Um, if you have a student in 10th grade who still has not mastered um, decoding um, phonics, whether it's decoding or encoding, then this, this uh, reading apprenticeship will not fill those gaps. They need explicit systematic instruction through those intervention courses I've described. At the same time, we cannot have our secondary students who think like 13 and 14 year olds and who are engaged in dialogue not have the scaffold of strategies for how to do that well in the authentic context of that discipline. So it's really um, parallel pathways. We want our students to be able to do both because we know that. Um, and the other thing that I will offer is that um, when we work with secondary students, um, we often talk about how gaps in literacy by the time they're of secondary age show up in multiple different ways. So you'll remember, of course, our famous pipe cleaner moment when we talked about those different strands. But what can happen over time is something similar to a compounding interest. We still need to keep the discourse at the level of their maturity and their engagement. So while there may be a different level of text that they're working on from a sound symbol correspondence, when we think about teaching them the phonics, they are still engaged in the discourse of their content classes learning about these concepts. And so we want to make sure that we're also developing those multiple literacies on a parallel path. And so Whenever we bring forward different initiatives, it's really because we're trying to illustrate the plurality of ways that we're developing the multiple literacies our students need to be ready for college and career, not as an either or, but but really as a both and. Um, so Ms. Craft or Ms. Wicks, is there anything that you want to chime in before I certainly ask Ms. Pester to, to chime in as well? No, I think I think that was perfect, Mache. I just wanted to add that 
Um, if you just think about a typical, and I know we have lots of schedules, but a, a typical seven period day of 45 minutes, what that ends up being, and, and it's a both and, is that their 7% of their day is spent in intervention. But that means that 93% of the, the day they're out in their other classes. And so by doing this rich literacy approach that we're not leaving it to that one period of intervention or intervention plus English, but we're saying that all day long that they are exposed to rich literacy experience experiences and that it takes in the entire village to create that literacy opportunity for our students. I would like to um, add, contribute to the conversation as well. And I think, you know, uh, Ms. Mack, this is a great example too of how to address the needs of students. I think of our work with GTCAC, right? And our 2E students. You may have a student who is dyslexic and is working through uh, some of those processing skills, but their ability to think and reason and discuss um, is not necessarily held back, right? So we don't want to hold them back from that robust critical um, discussion, uh, literacy experience and reasoning um, while we're also working on those things. Um, and so I just share that, you know, it's it's um, easy to think that you have to do, it's a very linear and sequential, but the reality is as students uh, mature, their ability to um, latch on to, uh, you know, challenging conceptual um, pieces that you find in all the disciplines is not necessarily held back. You know, they're able to engage in those conceptual pieces, those comprehension pieces, even while they're still working on those skill sets. So I just ask that we we not fall into that. You know, it, it's very linear. You can't do this until you do that. Um, and, you know, we prefer and try to work on that in those early grades, but um, it's really important as a way of keeping students sort of engage intellectually, even if they're still developing that skill set. So uh, that's that's my bit after uh, our experts. So I can uh, speak to that a little bit. As I said in the board meeting, I participated in an ELA class, mm -hmm. and I um, I think it was considered either an honors or a GT ELA class. But I I would say that. Um, I went into a breakout group on um, the book night mm -hmm. and we were actually looking at quotes and what they meant. And I, I one student was particularly um, well prepared and outspoken and he and I would look at the same um, quote from the book and had totally different mm -hmm. um, takeaways from it. And the fact his his reasoning was very um, intriguing for me and it made me think of things differently. So I do understand that. Mm -hmm. um, I just continue to worry about kids who are in high school who can't read. So that, as, I mean, that's the premise of, of my question. As do we all, right? <laughs> yeah. my yes. My and, and can I just ask your, two practical your, your, questions? No, Miss, Miss Mack. No, no, let me. No, no, me. I can't. <laughs> no, you may, but let me have my chance. Sorry. OK, you go ahead. OK, thank you. All right, um, Ms. Matt, I, having been a middle school teacher and principal and a, and a high school English teacher and principal, I clearly understand on different levels her concern. I, um, Dr. McComas, your point about, yes, we do want our students before they get to high school to get this, but what I would suggest is what we just saw maybe not on the same level, but conceptually are the things that can happen and I think should happen and I know do happen um, on a lower level in middle school. You have that same thing where from course to course, you're working on developing those thinking skills, that critical thinking skill because a person has difficulty with the reading does not mean that their ability to problem solve, to um, think critically are not there. They just find other mechanisms to make that happen. So what I found both being a teacher on the middle school level and the high school level, that when we found those students who were still struggling and within the class you had various um, um, levels that doing some of these kinds of things were those pieces that initiated and motivated the students 
to want to get the support. Because once you get out of elementary, probably by the time you've hit third, if you realize you're struggling and there's no other issue, there's no dyslexia, et cetera, there's something else going on, or you didn't get the skills you needed, a wall starts to build and you have to start chipping away at that. And so the last thing you want to do is to make students think that one negates their ability, i.e. being able to think, and to speak, that it, it's that is negated. So I use the K, which I don't even know whether they still teach the K in middle school, but we did um, when I was at um, what is now Northwest Academy. And we had that kind of blended class where there were some children who were struggling, didn't want to do it because they, they had their own angst about their inability to read. So we did these kinds of things, starting with looking at the cover, having the questions, they are read, look at the cover, those who are reading passages on every level based on their skills, and finding that those children who started out just trying to answer the questions, be a part of the conversation, that interest grew. And then they wanted, it was so much easier to do pullouts for them and give them what they needed to build those skills. And the same happened in high school. So I'm just suggesting uh, Ms. Mack and to our experts here that as wonderful as this is, and it is wonderful when you can make those connections um, across the, the various um, coursework, that it also, what this gives also serves in its own way as motivation for children the older they get who are still struggling. And we should never forget that, that I agree, it's not one or the other, and it's how we use um, these kinds of, of, of these parts to embrace and to motivate children. And that is so important. Just trying to give them intervention day in and day out, they're gonna turn off like a light. But this is motivating because it challenges, just in the discussion, challenges the brain. Thank you. Now, Ms. Mack. Now, I'm gonna to defer to Mr. Offerman because I think he had a question and then you can come back to me. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Actually, I have several questions. Uh, I'd like to, uh, if someone can can explain the concept of the of the uh, excuse me of the of the effect size. That was a, that was a stat that was given earlier in the presentation. What does that mean? So, in general, when um, that's a um, a term used by statisticians to report um, when something works, quote, uh, you know, I'm using air quotes to say, oh, this program works, to show how much does it work. So, what kind of an impact does it have on improving um, reading achievement? So, in this particular case, um, the slide was referencing that in the studies done for reading apprenticeship, because lots of programs, of course, as you know, will say they work or they had a positive impact. Well, is that going to mean a one point score raise? Because that's technically positive, but that's not really what we're looking for. So when we talk about and look at um, research studies around effect size, we're essentially looking at how significant an impact did the program have on the reading achievement scores of the students that were studied. Thank you. So, sure. Uh, the other question is, uh, or, or my next question is, uh, I'm assuming that, that those uh, that the uh, that the stats that were given were were uh, were from uh, schools other than uh, Baltimore County schools. Have have That's have correct. have we done any studies? So we have not yet. So what I will offer, and then I will certainly defer to Ms. Craft and Ms. Wicks because they are certainly closer to the work. Um, the reading apprenticeship begins as a professional learning opportunity. So you, when you decide and determine on the impact of um, an approach, 
whenever you're beginning with professional learning, you first study the impact it's having on leaders and on teachers. So our first round of um, evaluation, if you will, was around those um, data tables that we shared about our principles. So when we survey, we use surveys and professional learning surveys to say, are you seeing this actually implemented in the classroom? Then the second layer is to say, once we see evidence that that strategy and that approach is actually happening in classrooms, then you measure the impact on student achievement. So we had begun that work and in conversation with our partners um, in DRAA, and of course, as, as with everything else, had been a little bit suspended um, with our, um, not suspended in our efforts to do the professional learning, um, but sort of that's the next frontier because before you can measure whether the um, intended program or approach is having the impact, you first have to evaluate the um, fidelity of implementation, if you will. And so um, we that is a part of our roadmap for how we evaluate the effectiveness of this approach. But we began, as you saw even evidenced in the survey, our primary focus was on the impact it's having on teachers. Um, because, and, and it was also why we were intentional about showcasing our content area teachers. Um, and I'm sure Mr. Offerman, you probably remember too from your experience, um, in many cases, and this really speaks to what Ms. Pasteur was describing, that was really our audience. We tend to think that literacy strategies and approaches, our audience is primarily ELA teachers, and certainly they participated. But really the purpose of reading apprenticeship is to have that cohesive approach across content areas. And so our first measurement right now is around the effectiveness of us building that uh, coalition, if you will, of interdisciplinary teachers working together as a team to implement consistent strategies so that a student who in his, her or their day attends, you know, history class and ELA and math and science and Homeland Security, as the example Ms. Santos gave, um, they have that consistency. So um, with that, Ms. Craft and Ms. Wicks, I don't know if there's anything uh, you want to um, add, but the, you know, to your point, Mr. Offerman, we have not yet, you are exactly right, the data we shared was about the ESSA rating and the studies used to earn that rating of strong, um, but that is on our roadmap of things, uh, different factors that we need to look at in terms of success of the program. Ms. Craft or Ms. Wicks, is there anything I left out? Uh, Ms. Shea, you stated that perfectly. And so what we have been gathering is that evidence before you get to the level five where you see it in the student data um, is are they using that to plan? Are they implementing it in the lesson? And once all of those pieces are in place, then we can start looking at how is it impacting student achievement? So um, you have that trajectory perfect. So thank you uh, for summarizing that for us, Ms. Shea. And, and thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Mr. Hoffman, you have another question? Yeah, I, actually, it's uh, uh, I, I'd like to hear what what uh, what our experts think about the impact of virtual uh, of our virtual or or hybrid instruction in terms of this not being able to be applied as, as fast or or does that have a uh, a uh, a uh, a minimal impact? So um, I'm going to start and then again, I'll turn it over to my colleagues in secondary ELA. So it definitely has an impact on uh, the, the, the rate of change or the, the pace of impact. Um, and part of that is because um, the training itself had to shift gears. So we were really proud that we were able to start it um, to kind of restart it in that virtual cohort the way Ms. Wicks described. Um, but we did have sort of a hiatus um, in terms of our original rollout plan and the design for that professional learning because the nature of the program is it is a significant commitment. So schools did have to identify a team of teachers across the disciplines. They came out of the building for specific training, but then they also had ongoing follow up coaching in the classroom. And that was the part that really got sort of um, disrupted, if you will. So whenever you're talking about a professional learning initiative such as this, you want to see that transfer of how we do the initial training and then that transfer into classrooms. That's been the part that's been the most impacted. Um, and, and we'll certainly um, again kind of uh, slow the trajectory or rate of change that we've been hoping to see. I will say one of the benefits of virtual learning is that it does allow collaboration to happen um, a little easier. So teachers are able to, you know, the idea of visiting classrooms and being able to see each other's classrooms 
is actually easier in a virtual world. The idea we've grown significantly in our ability to use digital tools for collaboration um, and sharing documents through OneDrive. So I think there's been some bright spots. Um, there is also a difference in a lot of these strategies talk about annotating texts. And so, of course, doing that in a virtual setting versus, you know, good old highlighter and writing in the margins is definitely another shift. Um, but I would say that we've been able to visit some classrooms where we've seen some amazing teachers do remarkable things to improve that. Um, and I think as a life skill that um, students having facility with multiple ways of annotating text and, and note taking is not a bad thing. Um, Ms. Craft or Ms. Wicks, is there anything that you want to add or anything I left out about sort of how it's been impacted in the virtual world? Um, I would just add, go off. Oh, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, really quickly. I would just add in this virtual world, we have been able to continue our residency support and one of our middle schools took great advantage of the reading apprenticeship program and used our resource teacher instead of just working with the ELA department to really further and develop um, their work with reading apprenticeship. She worked with the science and the social studies department during that um, residency virtually and was able to give very intensive support to keep that going. So that was one of the things we were really excited to see it really taking life, even though we're in this virtual environment. So thank you. While we're talking about the virtual environment, I'm wondering if you've given um, Dr. McComas or any of, of the other speakers, if you've given any thought to expanding what this does so that when students are actually back in the class, will they, um, I don't know if that's Mr. Corrin's question as well, will they be able to have uh, these same kinds of opportunities where a class could go in with another class and maybe collaborate because that's one of the, the, the words certainly um, uh, taking a look. Ms. Mack talked about um, night and seeing it through, but seeing or, or talking and working from one class, even though the content area might be different or it might be the same, but you know, sharing, sharing the thoughts and the concepts around an idea. Any thoughts about that once students go back? Yes. Yeah, right. So, uh, oh, go ahead, Dr. McComas. Yeah. So I would, I would say, Ms. Pesher, um, you know, we have grown so much in the last 11 months, right, around our teachers' skill sets with using digital resources. And in particular, I think at our secondary schools, you know, just based on the way we had been implementing and rolling out slowly over time, the um, initiative to have devices in classrooms for teaching and learning process, you know, our secondary and in particular our high school really just started to receive those. They just really kind of got their foot in the water last year, if you will, and we went into the pandemic. And so uh, the, we have seen a phenomenal growth in terms of our teachers thinking about digital resources. How do we use digital resources? You know, that capacity because the context forced our hand to develop those skills much faster. And I would say that um, it's it's not, I don't foresee our teachers just abandoning all of those skills that they have picked up. So have I set forward any particular guidance on that, Ms. Pesture? I have not in my role, but I will share with you that I have been so um, proud of how our teachers have adjusted to an all virtual environment and how many skills they have developed at, at such a a quick pace relative to what we see around normal professional development. And as Ms. Shea said, transfer, right? So we've been providing professional development around digital um, resources to support the teaching and learning process for numerous years, but the transfer is slow. The adoption of that into our practice is slow. This whole pandemic has forced that uh, to, to speed up, and I don't see people abandoning all of those skills. I think it's just, force our repertoire to become more robust in a way that would have taken longer. And then, Mache, I know um, I kind of jumped out there. In front no, of that you. was perfect. I was just going to add um, one of the benefits. And so um, when we return in the next coming weeks, um, returning in a hybrid model, of course, we're still going to have some students um, participating virtually. Um, but to your point about collaboration, what's been really powerful, um, Ms. Wicks mentioned the residency model, which is part of how we support schools. 
the virtual learning environment has allowed us to combine schools for that coaching support in a way that was really difficult in a brick and mortar setting. And what that's enabled us to do is to bring like schools together and teams of teachers together, um, which has been really powerful. So teachers not only are visiting each other's classroom in their building, we're connecting them across, we're connecting classrooms across schools. And so I do think that having even a return in a hybrid setting continues to afford us some of those opportunity um, to be able to um, allow for that uh, collaboration. And then um, as Dr. McComas said, our teachers have developed um, a much uh, deeper bench of strategies for how to help students facilitate. Uh, we've learned about breakout groups in uh, Google Meet. We've learned about um, Google Docs and different shared spaces in OneDrive for students to actually collaborate. We've seen teachers in our secondary classes um, import text sources so that students are able to use Jamboard or other digital resources for um, virtual collaboration. And I agree with Dr. McComas that um, I don't see that slowing down. I think that that will only continue to grow as we return to the hybrid and then ultimately even in face to face because it affords the students a lot more opportunity for that kind of authentic collaboration. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Mack, will you? Um, yes, I, when I first came to the board and started visiting my schools, I remember walking into an elementary school and seeing a model that I hadn't seen anywhere else and that model was I'm hoping I remember this correctly. Rise, it was a reading intervention, if I understand it, for children who were not way behind, but mm -hmm. just a little behind to get them up to grade level. Is that, am I remembering that correctly? You are correct. Rise is a um, method aligned with a guided reading approach from Jan Hasbrook, um, and it does target the population of students that you talk about um, that are sort of on that, um, uh, frame, you know, just before not significantly um, challenged in terms of needing a tier three intervention, but closer to like a tier two where we would say that they are just outside of that um, range of readability. So my concern then with that, and it's, I think I have the same concern here is not all schools had the ability to implement RISE, even though one could argue that many of our schools would have benefited from it. So to tie it to reading apprenticeship, it sounds like Ms. Jay, when you were talking that this is potentially going to be rolled out as something that is available for schools to do. So this was rolled out to all schools. All schools were invited. Um, the percentage that we responded was because of the time commitment. So when we first did our different, um, when we first rolled this out, it does require teachers to leave the building and attend professional learning. And that's always the trade off when you're trying to invest in professional learning because we also hate to pull our experts from the classroom. So reading apprenticeship is something that is open and continues to be open for all middle and high schools um, to participate in. So my question is this, since we're going to get off of this call and get on the equity call, how equitable is that? Why? And I'm not challenging you personally, but I'm just thinking out loud saying if this program does all that we say it's going to do, mm -hmm. why should a student who goes to school A benefit from it and a student who goes to school D who for whatever reason, and I'm not blaming a principal or teachers, sure. can't or won't take the time, right. um, we are creating an inequitable situation. Right. So I think your your point is a really important one, Ms. Mack, and our goal as an office is 100%, right? Mm -hmm. So when we, we're not finished and we're not going to cap it. We're not going to say, oh, well, we've gotten 60% of schools. We're going to continue to offer it. We've been trying to explore, um, to, to hear from schools that haven't participated, to understand what are those barriers, to your point, not to pass judgment, but to be in a place of, so tell me why you weren't able to participate so we can. And so, for example, we have redeveloped it in a virtual approach. That will help. Some of the schools that maybe weren't able to participate before might be able to now because we have a new model. We've done some summer offerings. This summer, it wasn't as um, top priority because of course we were making so many adjustments, but we hope to have summer offerings. So, um, and the other thing is as we get more data, that is what we then use to go back to schools and say, every school has to do this because look, we've shown with our students, here we are, this is significant and we don't wanna let that be 
um, random. We don't want it to be that we have a proven program that we've seen working in our schools and it's just left to happenstance. Um, but what we want to do is really understand from each of those schools. So what's getting in the way? Why haven't you been able to participate in this? And then what can we do with that model to continue to provide that opportunity so that we get to 100%? Um, the way so that you a follow up question for that is, so at what point will we as a system think that this is something that warrants a full rollout? So that's question one. And once that determination is made, and I understand that we're waiting for data and we want to look at that type of thing, but let's just say this is a resounding success and we find that out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. At what point, given um, how things work and getting people involved, at what point would every middle and high school be doing this? Is it years? Is it months? What is it? So there's two, I'm going to start first and then I'll certainly talk to Dr. McComas. That is when we also partner with Division of School Support and Achievement. So um, we are at the point where our rollout includes all schools. So we will continue to offer enough spaces and opportunities in as many ways as we can come up with to ensure every school has the opportunity. Then what we do is partner with our friends in DSSA to say, OK, here are the 10 schools that have not been able to participate. What do we need to do until we get to 100 percent? So we we are already at the point where we do believe this is um, we've, we've shared all the data around the, the ratings. I think it does take time simply because of the commitment. You know it is and, and what we will continue to do then. So we I described before our model has initial training and then we have follow up coaching dates and then we have um, ongoing support through our offices. So then what we start to do is we form them into what we call cohorts. So Ms. Wicks referenced the cohorting. Um, I would guess that it will take us probably the next um, 12 to 18 months to be able to have enough cohort spaces that every school has been through it. Um, we won't stop until we get to 100 percent. You know, we, we are what what I meant to share too with the data is I think that helps people recognize because time is a commodity we never have enough for. And, and so there's no one that's saying to me anyway, I'm not coming because I don't think it's important. Typically it's because there's a lot of things that are really important and schools are trying to balance that. So what we just try to do is really just to be relentless and continue to offer it until we get to that 100%. And then if I'm being honest, we'll have to do it again because we'll have teacher turnover or leadership changes mm -hmm. or we'll have, you know, so so I don't really ever get to the moment where I can say we're done. Um, we just continue to engage in that. Um, and I don't know, Dr. McComas, if there's anything that you want to add to that. Yes, I would like to add. I think Ms. Mack, of course, thank you for the question because as you know, and I know Ms. Mack, you're intensely passionate about about instruction. I was actually thinking earlier, you, you missed your calling. You really should go into <laughs> education uh, because you are just so truly um, passionate and like laser like focus, right? So which we do appreciate, especially in this committee. So um, what I would say is it really speaks to a larger question, right? Around the importance of professional learning, rather it's for disciplinary literacy or open court or bridges or, you know, I could go on, right? There's, we're always trying to build our teachers' capacity and expertise around their skills and their knowledge because many things be have, you know, uh, we have learned much about brain research and how that helps, you know, drive quality instruction and so on. And so the work is, is never ending in that regard. But I will share with you, and I share this with you so genuinely because of your role as a board member and, and other circles that you may move in. And Ms. Pasture, your circles uh, with the legislative committee is um, people undervalue professional learning. They undervalue it in terms of, of time allocations for teachers. If you look at teacher cal or school calendars, rather it's Baltimore County, Hartford County, so you know any LEA in the in the state or across the nation, there is never built in adequate professional learning time that is fully dedicated to professionals developing their skills. And when the going gets tough, that's one of the first things that get cut. Um, and and what that shows is that we as a, a larger society under 
recognize the importance of it in keeping skill sets moving forward and developing for our classroom teachers. And it really only slows down progress for our children. Um, and so I, I just want to share that with you because whether it's this particular um, piece or uh, again, any of the other things that we're constantly trying to develop skills on. The other thing is, I mean, we're fortunate around yeah, funding. Dr. McCormick, before you go yeah. to the other thing, I, I really need to address that. I need to address it because I spent months sitting on the Kerwin Funding mm -hmm. Committee. What you're just talking about in terms of the PD, Ms. Mack's question and the answers is throughout what the blueprint mm -hmm. is about. So we do understand and we did go back and look, hired a company to go back and look at what professionalism meant outside of education so that we could make sure we were giving educators the kinds of supports, the kinds of opportunities and funding. So it's embedded in that. PD is, has now become almost the mantra. Systems are now starting to say this and it's becoming just even nationally that without that kind of training and supervision and opportunities, we cannot find the equity levels that we need, period. So when I've asked people long before I was on the board, why have you not, why are you not doing this? What have you ever been, if they were an AP teacher, um, have you ever been to one of the college board work? Well, no, why? So now what we have been given is whether we like it for our children day in and day out and to continue on a virtual mindset. So we have now crossed the Rubicon, if you will. We have learned some things that we should not dump out. And one of those things is that sometimes it's about getting from point A to point B. Virtual cuts the whole notion of trying to have that time that it takes coming out of your school to get there. So I'm just encouraging, um, and I'm glad Ms. Mack asked it as a board member because it is something we can support and support curriculum in doing, that we start processing different ways that we do PD, um, the kinds of things that people need so that they can grow because public education is suffering and we're killing populations of children. So I'm glad again, Ms. Mack asked that question, but no, Kerwin, when you look at it, it's throughout PD, 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 support, support, in-service, it's in there. So we need to grasp it because it's an election time. Everybody talks about education when they're campaigning. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Well, and thank you for sharing that it is prioritized in the Kerwin work because, again, you know, no one would ever say to a physician, oh, don't go learn the latest technique, right? But it's it sometimes can happen in our profession. So I just appreciate your advocacy and for you sharing that with us. And um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to just sort of put that on a larger scale than just our disciplinary topic today. So, um, okay, um, go ahead, Ms. Mack. I think you may have had additional questions. Um, no, except I will make a comment. Um, again, I'll, I'll start with RISE. Um, I spent a lot of time in that classroom and then I sought out other schools where that program was offered. And, but then I'd go to schools where I would think it should have been offered and it wasn't. And, you know, I, you kind of use an example about doctors. We would want our doctors to have, you know, required professional development well, when we rolled out bridges and we rolled out open court, we said to teachers, this is what, you know, start starting this fall, you are going to um, across the board for open court. And then, of course, bridges was new. You are going to use these. So we didn't give teachers the choice, but it sounds like with something like this, and I'm not standing here say, or sitting here saying, I think this is the greatest thing and everybody needs to get it. But if it is the greatest thing, I do think everybody needs to get it, and I think it needs to be approached more as a definitive and not as a choice. It, right. or not just this, but something that we know works 
and something that we've seen improvements, we have to figure out a way, and maybe it goes to Kerwin and things like that, to make sure that all children have the same opportunity to benefit. Because if it's given at an individual school level, um, for whatever reason, they may not do it. And that's where I become concerned. Right. Yeah. Dr. McComas, may I say something about RISE in particular and then, or I can defer um, to you if you want to go first. Yes, let me just go first, Meg. Sure. Gonna snack. I just want to say we agree with you on this team, right? Like we, and I will say to you, and I, I say this to give you hope and confidence, right? I think one of the things that is happening in BCPS as a function of some of the initiatives we have been working to implement uh, over the last three years is we are developing much stronger um, focus on fidelity of implementation, right? Which gets back to your point around everyone should have this. So why is this such a sort of, well, we opt in and then we convince people. Um, and so it's, you know, we as a system, I think are moving more steadily in this direction of like, no, this is the, this is what we're doing and we need to implement it with fidelity and we need everyone to get the training. So uh, I will tell you compared to five years ago, I feel like we're making progress on that because er the team that we have here and I appreciate you acknowledging sort of like this larger conundrum that we, we can wrestle with if we um, aren't really deliberate. Um, is that we do intend and want every school to, to participate and to do this well, to do it with fidelity, to do it with the support that they need. Um, and I guess I guess I just I really want to say we agree. We, we agree. Okay. So, Ms. Jay, you can go ahead. Well, yes, and thank you. And so um, we definitely agree in philosophy about having systemic initiatives and systemic professional learning and not leaving that to chance. The distinction I want to make around RISE is twofold. Um, first, RISE is um, one author, Jan Richardson's a framework for intervention related to a guided reading approach. And I know you know, Ms. Mack, that guided reading is not um, the same as that explicit phonics. And so we as a system based on evidence-based research prioritized explicit and systematic phonics instruction, which is why we identified open court and made that our system initiative in reading. We know that there are some schools and principals do have some agency then to supplement those system wide initiatives with things that their school is working on. And we did have some schools that were trying rise, had seen some success in their building, but it is not something that currently has an evidence based rating on ESSA. It is not something that supports that explicit systematic instruction in phonics. And so I just use it as it doesn't mean that it won't someday, right? It doesn't mean that there aren't eventually going to be studies to that end. But some of education is about um, sort of system wide priorities, if you will, because when we talked about those shrinking hours for professional learning, we also have to be really strategic and judicious in how we prioritize. And so in the last several years as a school system, we prioritized scientifically evidence supported phonics and explicit instruction and so that just to the specific example now that being said i don't in any way want to diminish the experience some of our schools had because sometimes that's how things begin so schools can say to us right so you had a, we had a system-wide initiative where we said no ifs ands or busts this is the core program we're funding it at the district level we're providing district-wide professional learning for administrators and teachers and we're going to expect fidelity of implementation based on that evidence rating. We also then will have other programs, other approaches, things that principals are trying on a smaller scale that then could serve to be that kind of jumping off point for future systemic initiatives. So I just wanted to make that distinction um, because I think that that matters. In no, and I think it matters too, but what I saw no matter what's, and I am not an educator, so the the under, I think Ms. Um, Pastor always use the word uses the word undergirding. So the undergirding may be out of my area of expertise, but what I saw in every school was the exact same thing. I saw four tables of six children sitting with either a para educator or a reading specialist or a teacher, getting very very focused instruction in reading. Um, no matter where I went, when you saw it, you knew what it was. So right. I. I guess what I'm saying is 
and that and you explained that some schools decided to do it that way and others didn't. Right. But, but I just I worry that if we if we let people pick and choose, if we come up, hit a home run that we know is helping students and we let people pick and choose, we're creating an right. inequitable situation. And, and and that's why I was making the distinction. So to your point, schools do not have the choice to pick and choose on open court. Open court exactly. is evidence rated, it's system wide. And what you saw, and part of what I think is really um, very interesting about what you described, some of the early findings are less about the actual program rise with a capital R I S E, and more about the fact that we had four teachers and small That's groups my of point. children. Yes. Right? That is the so, point. So that is another piece of it, right? So then we try to learn from practices and strategies. So and and that's just what I wanted. We we don't disagree that once there is something that is evidence rated, system funded, we have initiatives, it can't be left to chance and it can't be left to choice. We 100% agree with you and we'll also honor, it is one of the challenges of a very large school system because we have so many schools and so many teachers. And so, and like I said, I'm never gonna be finished with open court training because I'm always gonna hire new teachers every summer. Um, so it is definitely, we agree with you that when we have system initiatives, they should be that just that, they should be system supported initiatives. Um, but I know, and Ms. Pester and, and Dr. McComas have had this experience too, we also serve very different communities. And so we do rely on principal agency when they say, and they do it in consultation with us. So some of the principals of the schools you described at Mars Estates and Baltimore Highlands, they, you know, they consulted with us. We went and visited some things together and they said, well, we would like to try and see what we think. That can someday lead then to a system initiative for that training in the way that you described. So um, we're definitely on the same page philosophically. I just wanted to help understand sort of the distinction between some of the ways that those programs come to be. Thank you very much. Sure. I'm finished finally. <laughs> You know this is your favorite group, Miss Miss Mac. It is. <laughs> it's my yes, favorite it is. group. I'm, I'm proud about it. Um, I, I are there any, any other questions for this topic today? And if not, I have one more um, just a uh, courtesy announcement for the committee at large that I forgot to say earlier. Okay, and I and I want to just have a discuss discussion about our moving forward yes, our agenda. Go ahead, Ms. Dr. McCann. Okay. Thank you. Um, first, I'd just like to thank the team and as always, my favorite committee, of, and I've got to stop saying that because now I support equity committee, so I can't have favorites. Um, but I would just want to thank everybody because as always, we have really great um, discussions around the core work of, of Baltimore County School. So I just value the, our time together every month. Um, I did want to uh, provide you the courtesy. Um, we did find out, uh, you know, we had our ransomware attack um, around Thanksgiving and we just uh, have not been able to access the data that we need to work with equal opportunity schools um, right now. So what what we've agreed is that we'll pick up the work um, going into next year and I shared that with Dr. Williams. He asked me to make sure I share that with the committee to keep you updated on where we are with that. Um, and so I don't know, Dr. Wiss said you'll probably be more eloquent about explaining um, what it you know, the uh, where we kind of work to this point with equal opportunity schools um, for the time being. Sure. Um, so we did have Catonsville High that started in the beginning of the year. So they participated in some professional learning. Um, Perry Hall and Milford Mill also were informed. So Perry Hall was informed, um, I want to say sometime middle of the year once the contract was going through the approval process and then Milford Mill was Mill was contacted um, after the request of this committee, I believe, or maybe it was the full board or the contract committee to to add that additional school. Um, and so they're all aware um, that they will be in partnership with Eco Opportunity Schools. I have a meeting with them, those three principals, on Monday to explain that because of the ransomware attack, a, a piece of what Equal Opportunity Schools needs to do is um, do these student and staff surveys and because they're unable to do that because of um, on our end what we are not able to feed to them they have come to us and said you know we're, we're not a, a professional learning only type of um, organization and we think it's probably best if we just wait until next year when we have the information we need and we can really do um, you know 
the partnership in the way that they have shown to us works in all the other districts. So, um, so I'll be communicating that to the three principals on Monday um, and we'll pick back up hopefully at the start of the school year with those three schools. OK, thank you. Um, and I'm, again, I'm sorry I forgot to do that at the beginning of the meeting. And I just want to thank Ms. Cox for reminding me and make sure that I uh, followed through on what Dr. Williams asked, asked of me. Um, and then Ms. Pester, you want to talk about us moving forward? Yes, um, I really want to uh, go back. We, we're a little behind because I think this month we really were going to look at um, uh, the three Ds, uh, dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia. But um, so we've moved on. I like the format today. Um, I know there's some other things that have been um, put out there to be discussed. Uh, I know Ms. Mack had some points. I have some points. Others have had points where we can. I've asked uh, to send us information and then we'll look at the information and then we'll be able to better judge based on what questions we have as a result of looking at the answers you've supplied, how we fit them into a meeting because we have so many um, really ver what I consider very heavy things that we need to handle. I know that several board members and parents um, and, um, of our, and our educators are also concerned about um, dyslexia. So mm -hmm. I would like that to take pretty much, if not the whole time, uh, but very similar to what we did today. Uh, Mr. Mahumza at the Government and Legislative Relations Committee meeting last week brought up the bill that is out there. MABE has a position on it based on um, some past uh, changes and they have a position about this one. So I'm going to supply to that committee some background information on the three Ds just so they come to the this committee and to the board with some some body of information. So I'm saying that to say I really want us to dig deep because people have been asking me since the end of of the year last year um, when we're going to do it. And I keep telling them, well, this month, this month and things right. have happened, but they are looking forward a number of people, parents, etc., who are looking forward to hearing it. And it is critical. And I'm saying all of this so you understand the real gravity of it, not and, and as we talk about equity as well, because I am sure that there are far fewer people of color who really grasp those Ds and they need to for the sake of our children and the growth. So I want us, um, I would appreciate it for committee members as you're thinking about questions that we process them in terms of things that Ms. Um, Dr. McComas, Ms. Shea, et cetera, can give us in writing so that we can formulate whatever, uh, more questions or body, but that we take that particular piece as something that we embrace like you did today. Sure, and absolutely. And, and we were planning on um, Ms. Uh, Pesher to do the the dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, um, as you said, originally this month, but it got moved because we had fallen behind. But we will right. definitely commit next month's uh, committee to that. And I see Ms. Mack, I see you put ready to read screening um, results. So I I will work with the team and I think the other hangover topic um, way back um, we had also talked about sort of writing you know, like where are we with the work that we're doing to around our writing program. So we'll do uh, the 3Ds first and the ready to read act because they they sort of go um, not together but right. they all sort of tie in and then we'll get to I guess that would be April around with the writing uh, perhaps or Maybe and I don't, I don't think have a problem if you really want to take those two uh, singletons and put them together for March. I just because I want the three D's to be well crafted for the yes, number of yes. people that are asking. So yes. and I need to give them some time when it's going to happen so they can change yes. schedules and tune in. So if you'd rather 
do those other two things in March, fine, and we can do the um, dyslexia in April. Yeah, so no, I think let's do, I think we should it. do March. Right, we'll, we'll do March. I will send you for okay. sure that uh, date and that sequence. I'll send it to the whole committee so everyone can sort of see the roadmap uh, for the next couple of committee meetings once I confer with the, um, the whole team. And Dr. McComas, can I ask for what, something specific when you get to the Ready to Read Act? Yeah. Could you include in that presentation just a little bit about what a Dibble screening looks like to a kid? Yes. Um, I was surprised to learn what it was that it's, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it's not real words, but it's it's a way of under of how kids look at letters together and what it means to them is part of the assessment. Is that correct? Um, it is not about meaning of nonsense not, words, but we not do the use meaning, nonsense, but yes, the pronunciation but or recognizing. Yep. yep. When you are assessing or screening for phonemic awareness and understanding the letters and sounds, you don't want to use sight words because many young children recognize the word by sight right. the same right. way they recognize a picture. So yes, but we can certainly as part of that presentation do like a quick model or an example to show you exactly what those prompts look like for kids. Sure. Thank you very much. Sure. Yep. All mm -hmm. right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my screen says 401. So we are one minute behind. Yeah, we need to move <laughs> on. I'd like a motion at this point to adjourn. So moved, Mac. Can I get a second? OK, we're not staying here. I need a second. <laughs> second. Like, I'm not Mr. Me. Offerman. Um, folks, thank you so much for uh, 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 an informative and delightful uh, presentation and questions and answers. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much thank for the time. We appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you to my ELA team as well. Yes.